This will be a verse-by-verse -verse look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we're going to look at the topic of Jesus Christ, the undisputed champion. We're going to go through chapter 8, and I'm going to give you some reasons why that Jesus Christ is the undisputed champion. In Ecclesiastes 8.1, it says, Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. So the first reason why Jesus Christ is the undisputed champion is because he shines. A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine. In Genesis 40 and verse 8, Joseph said, Do not interpretations belong to God? And in Daniel chapter 2 verse 28, Daniel says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And he goes on to an interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's because interpretations belong to God. Who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? Is what Solomon asks in Ecclesiastes 8.1. Who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine. Second Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. When it comes to interpreting the Scriptures and giving you enlightenment about doctrine, it is Jesus Christ himself that shines. He is the God in heaven that reveals secrets. He knows the deep and secret things, and the light dwelleth with him. Just like any undisputed champion, he shines. And if you don't know which preacher is right, then go to the scriptures and let the Holy Spirit of God show you the interpretation. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the interpretation belongs to God, and He shines. In Isaiah 28, 9 through 10, Whom shall He teach knowledge? And whom shall He make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, Line up on line, line up on line, here a little and there a little. That's how you get the interpretation. Going back and forth through the Bible. Looking at the word through the Bible. So Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 8.1, Wisdom maketh his face to shine. If we are going to shine, then we get around the one who really shines. Spending time with the Lord is how your face can shine like Moses in Exodus 34.29. The Lord's face shined in Matthew 17 too. You know how your car gets dirty and you spray it down and throw some Dawn dish liquid on it, throw some wax on it, and it shines like new. You have to do that with your walk as a Christian. Get up close to Jesus Christ and let him knock some of that gunk off of you so that you can shine and you'll know the interpretation of the scriptures. Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 8.1 that wisdom, that, a, that man's wisdom maketh the boldness of his face to be changed. If you get close to Jesus Christ and walk in the light as he is in the light, your prideful face will be humbled. The boldness of your face will change. One of the things that God hates in Proverbs is a proud look. When you stand next to the undisputed champion, the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find out that you aren't all that. When you get in the scripture, it's like looking in the mirror. It shows you your flaws, and it will cause your boldness to be changed. I think I look all right until I get next to a mirror. You might think you're, you're doing all right until you open the scriptures, and you see that you're not doing all right. You need to do better. Jesus Christ exposes our sins. He shines. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God, 
who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. His face shines. He's the undisputed champion. Our righteousness or our wretchedness is never more visible than when we're standing next to the undisputed champion. If you go against the greatest person there is in any field, it will expose all of your weaknesses, your flaws. You get next to the undisputed champion, you're going to see some things that need to be fixed. But next he's the undisputed champion because he's king over both kingdoms. Jesus Christ is king of the kingdom of God and he's king over the kingdom of heaven. In Ecclesiastes 8, 2, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God. When it comes to living on this earth, we are to obey the laws of the land as long as, as, long as they don't go against God's laws. In Acts 5, 29, it says we ought to obey God rather than men. In 1 Peter 2, 17, it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. This world doesn't have a perfect king yet. Soon there will be a perfect, sinless, absolute dictator on the throne, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the undisputed champion on the throne, and he will rule with a rod of iron. You can't impeach him. He comes in and he takes the kingdom of heaven by force and brings his army of born-again believers that make up his kingdom of God. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 8, 2, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. It was wise counsel not to go against Solomon. It is even more wise counsel not to go against the king of kings. Ecclesiastes 8, 3, Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Uh, men tried to get out of the sight of Solomon. You might could get out of his sight. He's a mortal man. However, Jesus said in Matthew twelve forty two, a greater than Solomon is here. And he was referring to himself. You can't get out of the sight of the undisputed champion. Second Chronicles sixteen nine says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's the king. And he's the undisputed champion because next his words are weapons. Ecclesiastes 8, 4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? King Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and he fleed from Solomon before he was king, because where the word of a king is, there is power. Uh, one word from Solomon, and he was going to have Jeroboam killed. Uh, when a man uses the King James Bible... And quote scripture, he has power behind what he's saying. Uh, for example, my preacher, my pastor, Donnie Dalton, quotes the King James Bible so many times in a sermon that it's like bombs raining down from a thundercloud. And then you have when John MacArthur quotes the ESV, it, it just it's just cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Where the word of a king is, there's power. It's like bombs dropping. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the head of all things, and by Him all things consist. When He made the worlds, He spoke it into existence. Where the word of a king is, there's power. He used the word to turn the lights on. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He's the undisputed champion because his words are weapons. Revelation 19, 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There are some uh, competitors in all different types of sports and fighting, that their words can intimidate their opponent. They can win with their words. 
Ecclesiastes 8, 4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? God is going to give every lost man a chance to question him at the great white, great white throne judgment. Everyone wants to question why God does what he does, and they will finally get their opportunity. You'll finally get your opportunity to say, What doest thou? If you're lost. Every man will be compared to him at the judgment. That's the next thing. He's undisputed because every man will be compared to him. Just like in any field. The people will be compared to the champion. When a lost man stands at the great white throne judgment, he will be lined up against Jesus Christ and will quickly find he is out of his league. <laughs> In Ecclesiastes 8, 5, it says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. What's the basic commandment for you today? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you don't do that, then you're lost. And you're on your way to hell. And then one day, the great white throne judgment. A wise man's heart discerns time and judgment. Time is a gift. God gives us time and then rewards us if we use it right. A wise Christian will realize this and use it wisely so that he will do better at the judgment seat of Christ. Ecclesiastes 8, 6, it says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. Deep down, sinful man knows that death and judgment are coming. For this cause, he is miserable and without God, because without God, he is hopeless in these matters. The greatest thing you can do is get saved, and Jesus Christ will apply his righteousness to you. He will apply his righteousness to your account. Imagine if you were a boxer, or any kind of champion of any kind of fighting. Imagine if you could give every type of skill, expertise, unbeatableness, perfection, and perfect attributes that you possess. Imagine if you could just in instantly transfer those over to your trainee. Imagine if you could just transfer these things over to him so that he would just automatically be victorious. That is exactly what Jesus Christ, the undisputed champion, did for you when you got saved he took his expertise his skill set his righteousness and he transferred it over to you and you may not realize it yet because you don't have your glorified body yet but at the rapture you're going to realize it you already have his righteousness your soul is as sinless as his is because he gave you his righteousness and at the rapture, he's going to give you his body. But right now, you have his imputed, righteous, imputed righteousness. Romans 4, 5 through 6 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. This is imputed righteousness. The moment you got saved, the Lord gave you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When it comes to your eternal soul, it became perfect at that moment you believed. He put you in the Lord's army. He made you a warrior. So therefore, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you aren't judged like they're judged at the great, great white throne. Your eternity is settled. And when you're placed next to Jesus Christ, you come out as sinless as he is because when God sees you, he sees his righteous blood. The righteous blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's been applied to your record. Jesus Christ is the Savior and champion of the whole world. And he's undisputed because he knows your next move. In Ecclesiastes 8, 6, and 7, it says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? A man doesn't know what will happen from one second to the next. In Proverbs 27 and verse 1, it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, 
for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James 4.14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. You don't know when death or judgment is going to hit you. The only future you know for sure is what's written in the scriptures themselves. Jesus Christ wrote the scripture. Jesus Christ knows your next move. For this reason, he's undisputed. He can see you moving in slow motion. He can see the attacks of the enemy in slow motion. He can pause it and rewind it and fast forward it, hit play on it. He could record it and watch it later if he wanted to. He knows what you would do before you do it. A good boxer or athlete studies their opponent. Just like we need to know some things about the devil so that we are not ignorant of his devices. The Lord automatically knows everything about everyone. Matthew 10.30 says, The very hairs of your head are all numbered. The Lord knows every single detail about every enemy that he has. In Psalm 147.4 it says, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. If you are limited on what you know, then wouldn't you want to join up with the one who knows everything that there is to know? In Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. There is none like him. He said it himself, There is none like me. For I am God and there is none else. Jesus Christ is undisputed because he defeats death. He defeated death. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8 it says, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. There isn't a man alive or dead that had the power to retain the spirit. Now, you don't know the day and hour of your death. You have no control in the matter. You can't even raise yourself up, up out of the grave on your own. There is no discharge in the war of life. And nobody's getting out of death. Every man born participates, and the only way out of this life is through death. Uh, the devil had the power of death in Hebrews 2.14. But Jesus Christ gave a knockout punch to death when he rose again the third day. And Jesus Christ had power over death to defeat it. He's the undisputed champion. The moment you get born again, he also gives you victory over death. Because he got victory over death. And he gave you everything that he had. Remember, we talked about how, imagine if you were the champion in any field. And you could transfer all your skill set over to your trainee. To where he could be as good as you. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Death was undefeated until Jesus Christ showed up. He's the undisputed champion. The moment you get born again, he gives you victory over death. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty three through 57 it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. It's talking about the Lord giving you a new body. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has victory over death. And when you get saved, you get victory over death. Jesus Christ is undisputed because he is the ultimate ruler. In Ecclesiastes 8 9, it says, All this have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is time, there is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. Solomon applied his heart to do everything under the sun. He found out what it was like to be the wisest man on earth and what it was like to live for the flesh and do what his flesh wanted at the same time one of the things he found out was that some men rule 
to their own hurt. When some men get in leadership, uh, he it can go to his head. And they will destroy themselves with this power and hurt others in the process. This is why one of the qualifications for a pastor in 1 Timothy 3.6 is not to be a novice. In 1 Timothy 3.6 it says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. He hurts himself with his leadership and he hurts the people that he's the leader of. But Jesus Christ, the champion of our salvation, will be the ultimate ruler on a physical throne, and all men will abide by his rules or else. I mean, he's going to get rid of everything bad. You're not going to be able to do bad things when he's on the throne. He can see you out there what you're doing, and he's going to have a whole bunch of other sinless beings walking around everywhere that's going to know what you're doing. You're not going to be able to have a, a sex trafficking ring. You're not going to be able to have all this alcohol flowing everywhere you look. Jesus Christ is the ultimate ruler. And Jesus Christ is undisputed because his enemies are forgotten. In Ecclesiastes 8.10, it says, and, I, and so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. All the enemies God, all the enemies that God has, will one day be forgotten. Many of them already are. They are dead and buried. And my pastor is always saying, Buddha is dead, Muhammad is in the ground, but Jesus Christ is alive. Nobody's going to remember Buddha, Buddha and Muhammad. Nobody's going to remember them. If you look in the scriptures, you'll see Jezebel got ate by the dogs. Pharaoh died a long time ago. Haman got hung out to dry. Absalom got hung out to dry. The rich man in Luke 16, I mean, he nobody's going to remember him. Ahab and Cain, Alexander the coppersmith, and the wicked, they're going to be dead and buried. Nobody names their kid Ahab. Nobody names their kid Pharaoh and Haman and but the coming Antichrist and false prophet will be tossed into the lake of fire in Revelation 19.20. The devil is going to do this, the same. He's going to the same place in Revelation 20 and verse 10. The wicked get buried and forgotten. The Lord laughs last and he laughs best. Everything they did and all their accomplishments were all vanity. The devil accomplished more evil than any being in existence. But it was all completely vain. Jesus Christ is undisputed because his enemies are forgotten. People remember the champion. They don't remember all of his enemies that he fought because they lost. And they lost bad against the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is undisputed because he's patient. And Ecclesiastes 8.11, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. A great fighter doesn't have to run straight at his opponent. He's patient. The Lord is patient with his saints and his enemies. He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He will be long-suffering and patient with people. For this reason, they think they are getting by with the things that they're doing. So Solomon says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know, when you do something wrong and a lot of time goes by, sentence against an evil work is not being executed speedily, you think you're getting away with it. The more you sin and God lets you get by, the more you'll think you're getting away with it. God's patient. Men are dead set in doing evil in this age. They want extra rights to do evil. They get to the point where they have so much and aren't being checked for their sin they think they have need of nothing. The church of Laodicea, Revelation 3.17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. They think they can sin and get by. They don't realize God is just being merciful with them, and giving them a chance to believe. Revelation 2.21 
talking about that the Jezebel that comes in the tribulation. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. He's giving you a little space to repent. Sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily many times. Romans 2, 4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God's given these people a chance. He's not executing the sentence speedily. He's giving you a chance to repent. If you're doing something wicked right now and you're not being uh, checked for it yet, He's given you a space to repent. If sentence against an evil work isn't executed speedily in your life, then this isn't a license to just keep doing it. It should be a wake-up call. Hey, I'm, I'm doing this horrible sin. I'm not being checked for it. You should go ahead and get that thing fixed before you get checked for it. Go ahead and turn to God now before you face the consequences. Jesus Christ is the undisputed champion because he's patient. And next, because of his longevity. In Ecclesiastes 8, 12 through 13, it says, <clears throat> Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. The enemies of God will not only be forgotten, but their days won't be long. His days may be prolonged on this earth. So it says, though a sinner do evil on hundred days and his days be prolonged, they may be long on this earth, according to this world's standards. But then verse 13 shows us those days are still a shadow. One hundred years, one hundred days on this earth is a, sh a shadow compared to eternity. And since he didn't fear God, he rejected the gospel, he's going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. It shall not be well with the wicked. He may prolong his days on this earth, according to verse 12, but according to verse 13, neither shall he prolong his days. Because when it comes to eternity, he's going to be facing the second death. And it says in verse 12, it shall be well with them that fear God. You may not have as much as the rich man in this life, but you're still better off because gain isn't godliness. According to 1 Timothy 6, 5, Jesus Christ didn't have a place to lay his head when he walked and talked on this earth, but he's alive. He is undisputed because he has longevity. He is the ancient of days, according to Daniel 7, 9. He is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, according to Revelation 22, 13. Psalm 41, 13 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus Christ is undisputed because he has longevity. Nobody's ever been this good for this long. He's been good from eternity past. He'll be good to eternity future. And he's undisputed because he's been through the trenches himself. The best champions have been through the trenches. They've been through some things. In Ecclesiastes 8.14, it says, There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. In this life, some wicked men live healthy, wealthy, and they're taken care of. You might think they were righteous. Also, in this life, some righteous men are drug through the dirt. You might think they were wicked if you saw them because they are going through such a mess. But in Jesus Christ left heaven. There he he was rich in heaven and came down to go through the trenches. In 2 Corinthians 8 9 it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. It says in Philippians 2, 6 through 7, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and, made, and was made in the likeness of men. The devil and his counterfeit gods wouldn't go through the trenches. They certainly wouldn't go through the trenches for you. If they did, they wouldn't come out as a champion. The devil attacked Jesus Christ in the flesh, and Jesus Christ won. 
This is even after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You have the one of the most powerful spirit beings going against Jesus Christ as he's walking on this earth in the flesh. And Jesus Christ still won. Jesus Christ defeated the flesh. He was tempted by the devil to sin just like you get tempted. But he never gave in to the temptation. And Ecclesiastes 8.15, Solomon says, Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. That is what the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to eat, drink, and be merry. And that is what man has always done with his time and will do from here on out. Because it shows us that in Matthew 24, 37 through 38. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They were eating, drinking, and being merry back in the days of Noah. They're doing it today. They're going to be doing it in the tribulation. The mind of man today is on feeding the flesh. He thinks about eating, drinking, sinful pleasures, video games, movies, ball game statistics. The flesh is kept full. It's kept pampered. It's kept entertained. But Jesus Christ is a champion that went through the trenches. He fought the flesh. He lived poor. He didn't feed the flesh while he was here. A real champion will do things the flesh doesn't like. Running exercising, eating better, sleeping better, and the list goes on. Spiritually speaking, if you're going to have a victorious Christian life, then you need to go through the trenches and put down the flesh. Jesus Christ is the undisputed champion because nobody can figure out his secrets. In Ecclesiastes 8.16, it says, When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Solomon spent so much time thinking about how things work and how God works that he couldn't find sleep for his eyes in the day or the night. He was up day and night trying to figure things out. In Ecclesiastes 12, 12, it says, And further by these my son be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. Jesus Christ is undisputed because even the wisest man that ever lived couldn't find out all of his secrets. Job 9, 8 through 10 says, Which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the ways of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, O the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You can't Google it to find out how he works. You got to have this book. Knowing this book, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the only way to find him out. And you still can't find him out then unless he lets you. Ecclesiastes 8, 17, Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet shall he not find it. Yea, further though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. You're not going to know everything about the Bible. The day you think you know everything is the day that you prove that you know absolutely nothing. In 1 Corinthians 8, 2, it says, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. When someone is really good at something, people say, What's your secret? But you can't find out all of the Lord's secrets. He lets the saints know a lot down here when we pick up the Bible. And then when we get our glorified body, He's going to let us know the rest of it. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. When you get your glorified body, He's going to let you in on a few little secrets. But He's undisputed because His ways are past finding out. If the enemy can't figure you out, if he can't figure out all your, all your tricks 
and your expertise, then you've got him. And nobody can figure out the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't find out his secrets. He's undisputed. 